I'm just asking anybody who's serving as a representative, if you want home health care and there's a dispute about what's going on in the case, talk to your client and find out what's going on and make sure that that information is then communicating to, to us. We don't sponsor or endorse any providers. There are some providers that are out there marching around saying we are a DOL approved provider. Again, like what I said before, yeah, they're approved to bill us. That's it. We don't we don't verify that you're a valid provider or anything like that, um, other than you can bill us. So we're not determining whether you have licensure and all that kind of stuff. I mean, they should, but um, all we're interested in is do they meet the qualifications to bill us? Okay. Um, and a claimant may change providers at any time, and this drives providers nuts. Because what happens is, I'm getting services over here, believe it or not, these providers all have, I don't know how they get the information, but they get information about these people, and they send people to the home. And these folks are elderly, very elderly, and you get somebody at your front door saying, hey, the guys that you have in there now, they're no good. They suck. We can do this. We can guarantee you this level of care. And, you know, these folks are like, okay, well, that's great. Come on in. I'm, I'm, I'd love to have you guys. And then nobody tells us. So then we start getting bills from somebody else. And the other provider's like, well, wait a second. You know, we have the authorization through January 1st, 2013. Now this other provider's in the home. Or there's a fight in the front yard because nobody knows what they're doing. Um, well, we're not saying it happens all, with all the companies. Or with <laughs> yeah. the I've seen it happen. <laughs> It's becoming more and more of a problem. It's just that's that we need, you, we need, what I'm asking is just that when you're in that situation, you know, understand that we have to do pre-approvals, that you have to have the medical justification for whatever care is being asked for, and if there's any contention or issue, the claimant decides what goes on, okay? Um, and then make sure that that information is communicated to us. So. I've gotten calls from the elderly claimants who had not had home health care and they have somebody on their front porch and they're saying, mm -hmm. say, how did they get my information? And I'm like, don't know because it wasn't from me and I don't know where don't it's coming it. from. Right. We don't give it and to them. They have networks. I, I mean, it's probably yeah, the bad networks. networks. Yeah. The stands and everything. Well, I mean, and you know, scary. and we just have, you just have to really care about this. And they need to understand also, <laughs> they need to understand also that they don't, if, if, if the claimant doesn't want a nurse, sometimes the, the nurses, we've had some of them say that they, the DOL has, has mandated it, if you don't get it now, you'll never get it, um, and so you really need to say yes to this, and so they do, and we've had that happen before, so they need to understand this is their choice if they want a nurse to help them if they really need a nurse, um, and they can choose who they who they have. But usually that should be coming from their doctor. Their doctor says you might really benefit from somebody in your home to help you with ambulation or oxygen or whatever else. And it, but in the other hand, if it's the company driving it rather than the doctor rather than the claimant, claimant has every right to say no, thank you. Was there about reach? I think we just started sending out some information there, with the... There's an attachment that goes out with every final decision that, for an acceptance yeah. that details what their responsibilities and rights are for home health care. And that's why we've been doing this home health... Well, actually, this medical provider outreach. But anyway, if you have like a hotline number, they can call your office. So if there is a community, they have a question, it's not just one piece of Well, we have, we have a 1 800 number for each office. So okay. if they want to call their claims examiner to talk about their case, they can also go to the research centers and they plus, can talk to them about these issues. Plus, plus, plus there's, there's specialized staff in the district mm -hmm. offices that oftentimes handle home health care simply because there is such a huge workload associated with that. Right. Um, so generally, the claims examiners that are specialized for that will be able to address whatever questions. I'm just, we don't know necessarily what's going on, especially when there is this sort of issue with what, what's going on with the providers, because the providers themselves can actually ask for authorization for care. And that's that's also an issue, is that you know the providers can come in, so provider A finds out about this client, they send an authorization without even meeting the person. You know, so we can get all we get all kinds of very strange things. So it's it's a huge work volume and it's just a lot of things that are going on that's resulting in some scrutiny. Um, but Nonetheless, the important thing for you is what I'm trying to communicate here today is that once you get that authorization in place and we've granted it, we do everything in writing, we'll send a notice saying you're authorized in this period of time, start doing your leg work 30 to 60 days before it expires, which means you're going to have to get the updated medical information from the physician 
justifying a renewal of that care, um, and um, we, we can be fairly flexible on extensions, but it's important, essential for the physician to give us a rationalized opinion. If the doctor's just coming in saying, I'm recommending 24-7 in-home nursing care for somebody, that's not going to cut it. We need, that. we need to know the rationale for it. Um, How long are your authorizations for? Six months. Usually, depending Usually. on what the doctor says. Sometimes the doctor will say less, sometimes he'll say more. Okay. Usually it's six months, so we don't normally go beyond six months. Okay. okay. Really quickly, my last slide. Um, uh, I just had some general thoughts here on some things that I thought were very important to talk to you folks about. I know you hate it. I know when you get these development letters, you're like, oh my Jesus, you know, why, why do I need to do this? Um, respond to those development letters. I, you know, I know the complaints about I've sent this three times and you're asking for it again. When we generally send development letters, there's something going on that we need information for, and we need to get that information. There's something that is problematic. There's some deficiency. The other big thing, like a park darn, we evaluate cases on written documentation, written evidence, okay, uh, which means good medical, good factual, good exposure, good toxic stuff. Uh, it's important for us to see it on paper, okay? Because that's what the claims examiners are looking at. That's what the FAB hearing reps are going to look at on uh, the review for the final decision. Uh, you don't need to request reopening for uh, previous SEC or previously denied cases that are potentially going to the SEC. However, if you're in a case, if you're looking at a case that you think should be part of the SEC and you're not getting that notification that's being reopened for approval, you can always request a reopening at any point on any case. Just know that when you request reopenings, you're going to have to provide the rational evidence to support that reopening. Just complaining about the denial of the case, saying how unjustified it is and how horrible it is and a horrible program, <laughs> it's not going to get you anywhere. You actually need to produce that documentation about what is it about the evidence in the case that justifies reopening or what I've obtained that warrants reopening the case. Uh, monitor our website and NIOSH for... Um, mm -hmm. Uh, new SEC classes. How many people have listened in on the workshops, the NIOSH workshops? So that's where they talk about the new ones, what, which ones they're recommending for uh, approval. So oftentimes, because I know that they have public discussions where the uh, advisory board gets together and they talk about it. Um, for those folks that actually get their hands on studies or other kinds of evaluations, I know some of you folks that are, have science backgrounds, we take it and we'll look at it. A lot of people, you know, it's odd how many people do not utilize this. For as much complaining as we get about all the lack of information in SEM, how few uh, submissions we get with people sending in anything to show that diabetes has a link to a particular toxin. You know, we need to have that information. It can be submitted all through the SEM portal. Um, anything that you're going to be doing with uh, regard to ancillary care, And certain other types of high cost uh, things. Don't go out and buy that Tempo Pedic, you know, X1000 bed without a pre approval in your hand. Um, you need to do that before we'll, we'll Is it pay. still over 1500 or something like that? If it's a DME over a certain threshold, we have to pre approve it. So I don't know, I think it's $1,500. I'm not totally sure. Yeah. So that's it, just on the, really, on the really brief stuff. So I hope it wasn't too long. Yes. I have a, just one comment and then a question. Yes. What I do as a, as a uh, authorized rep is I stress to every one of my other people, do not talk to anyone. Call me if you have received any letters, any yeah. phone calls from anybody, mm -hmm. and I will screen it and make sure that it's a proper thing that you can respond to. There's, and you really have to stress it to them because they're older. And, yeah, and there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of confusion about the program. And it's, I mean, it's complicated to begin with. That's why we're all here. Ten years, you know, uh, you know, years after the program's inception, it's just because it's a complicated process. As is a lot of worker comp programs, but uh, mm -hmm. it is complicated. There are all a lot of challenges, but I think you know it's demonstrated by the folks okay, here yeah. that yeah, they I, really want to work towards getting now, a solution. Now, my question, which is really, really important, is regarding impairment evaluations. I know that uh, Judy's going to go speaking on that. I heard an answer call her question. But my <laughs> question is this, because I don't think she can answer it. I've had several people now who are going in for their re, uh, you know, their two year thing. They cannot perform a PDFT. They, the doctor will write on there, or the technician or whoever gives it to them, they do not have enough lung volume to get it done. I've even had a couple pass out. One person's heart stopped when he was trying to blow, 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 you know, to get the delta. 
What can we do about that? Because your impairment evaluation is based on the PFD, basically. No. So what can we do tool. about that? That's not the only tool. And they need to they need to use the other tools in the AMA fifth edition toolbox. It's the cheapest one, and that's why they like to use it. The more expensive evaluation is the more accurate evaluation, and we don't rely just on PFTs. There is a, it's a smaller version of an exercise tolerance test with a closed loop where they do a DLCO, and they also check the heart rate. And if they're not doing that, they're not doing it according to the AMA guide. Yeah, I mean, our, all of our impairments are strictly to the AMA guide, so... You know, but there's I, a cheap so, and dirty way to do so it. So I can't speak. It. I'm, I'm not an expert on right. that, guys. Well, my, Dr. Ford has even tried to perform it on one of the people. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is impossible. I just can't do it. He was trying to do it in court. And he has a... Laura well, is very creative at figuring out ways around that. Yeah, stuff, but so. he yeah. could not do the impairment for this yeah. gentleman most, because he wasn't able to do that. Most cardiophysiology labs have the equipment they need for the test. It's, it's not something but that then the DOL will pay for that, right? Yes, they do. You know, I, I don't know about impairments very well, but I know that there, there are, in a lot of other instances, there are other things that the doctor can look at, like ADLs and mm -hmm. other types mm -hmm. of functionality tests that can be evaluated in lieu of other things. So I think Faye's probably got a good point that there are, well, yeah, are likely alternative lady, things. And they want, you know, Laura's usually pretty good about figuring out different so ways of figuring out. Okay. Thank you. I have an off-staff you can talk to because we run into that with our own. Uh, what about the billing? Um, within a budget year, it went from $2,500 max for impairment to $1,500 max, now $750. Mm -hmm. And I know that it was supposed to be based on other programs' cost of an impairment, you know, what right. people were charging for impairment. So, but the thing is, is when you have a budget year, isn't, aren't those things decided already? And how in the middle of a year would it be changed? It's not based on the budget year at all in terms of the medical bills and the, and the schedules that we pay. The impairment, um, when this first, when, we, when our program first started out, um, and we, we kind of saw impairments as kind of second opinions that we should be paying in a certain way, like we would a second opinion, which is pay as bill. And... Was that three hundred dollars per hour? Or it was. Well, there, there was that. That was the DMC process. But in terms of impairment itself, if you went out and got your own physician to do it, that physician was paying us, was billing us up, upwards of, in some cases, you know, twenty five hundred dollars mm -hmm. every time they went and got an impairment rating done, and we paid it because it was pay as bill. They'd go get a test, and instead of that test being subject to a fee schedule, they would pay. We would pay the full amount, like the example that John gave earlier. You know, normally hospitals will bill an insurance company and get paid by the fee schedule. We were paying them whatever they billed us. Mm -hmm. So we found that that really wasn't appropriate and it wasn't, it wasn't really in line with the way that we should be doing business. And we went ahead and went with, when we got a new CMC contract, that was already baselined a lot lower for all of them, for the, the impairment.